All right, welcome to my show. This is Verlaine Hell. I've been taking notes. It's all thought out in a roundabout way. I'm trying to welcome my special guest today, legendary fellow New Yorker, Jeff Berlin. Fellow New Yorker, I miss the island. I really do. Do you have that accent still? I don't hear it that much. No, it's mollified a bit, but the other day I went to a bank, and uh, it's funny, uh, I went to a Wells Fargo here in uh, Nashville, and I sat down, the lady says, you know, oh, hi, can I help you? And I said, well, I have a problem with my uh, with my debit card. She says, what part of New York are you from? I <laughs> so, you can, I, you can I, take I the boy out of New York, you can't take huh? the New York out of the boy. No, you can't. You can take New York out of you can take the boy out of New York. Can't take New York out of the boy. Uh, <laughs> I, I I miss the island. You know, I really do. I love Great Neck. I thought it was a beautiful community. I understand from people that lived live there saying it's not the same town that I grew up in. Um, the island, of course, is transformed. It's uh, it's a remarkably built up area now, quite expensive, but there's still a vibe, a Long Island vibe. It, it's it's. Uh, it's a part of my DNA. I'm, I'm quite simply a New Yorker to the end, no matter where I am in the world. Great music scene, if you can afford the taxes. It's really gone right, through the right. roof, but we have a lot of music venues now. The Paramount's back, and um, they are saying that the next one that's going to be the big one on Long Island is down in Patchogue, the, uh, the Emporium. Oh, okay. All right. I'll have my bode that live music is coming back because it has taken a hit. So mm -hmm. it would be nice to view uh, that uh, people and the industry are aiming or focus on, uh, let's say, using live musicians. It was the standard in which we all uh, made music. We toured as live musicians. We played as live musicians. We recorded as live musicians. But that fairly fell into uh, fairly a kind of a more the Malay is a kind of a, a non-issue anymore. I mean, people can hire a guy that has a keyboard and who can cover all of the instruments. And that is the sign of the times that we have. And, you know, uh, that's fine. But I, as a player, and my colleagues as players, we we have something that is quite special. It's as exciting as, as an actual Broadway show to watch guys that really know what they're doing as players and demonstrating that, not for the audience, interestingly, but for ourselves. Musicians... If they're really great, in my opinion, they're selfish in that I'll play for me. I'll play to uh, to exact something in me that makes sense, something that is passionate for me, something that I feel for me, something that satisfies me. But at the same time, I know there's an audience there. Mm -hmm. And so it's not like, you know, a disregard like, ah, yeah, yeah, you're here. Uh, on the contrary, if I feel good about my playing, I feel like I've had, you know, a few hundred friends to share it with. And that's the love, the interactive love, I think, of music. So uh, I'd like to see more live music. I'd like to see that club in Patchogue do well. I'd like to see the Paramount do well. Yeah, I mean, to me, nothing replaces live music. And that's kind of tied into my questions and the arguments that I have with my son. He's only 18 years old, started school for audio engineering. And I see him in his room, and he's like simply copying and pasting things. <laughs> and I say to him, and I sound like an 80-year-old woman, Back in my day, it was scotch tape and a razor blade. So... Well, your son represents this era's technology, uh, first of all. And secondly, your mom, so what do you know? And, you know, and thirdly, he has to cut and tape and paste and, and succeed and fail. It's a bumpy, gritty, actually dirty road improving in anything that's related to technology if you're self-taught. And in music, if you're self-taught, the whole paradigm is, quite frankly, uh, unsteadiness, bumpiness, grittiness. Uh, people like it sanitary, so, uh, but it isn't. The greatest players never got there by being on a clean path of musical progress. And I think your son, in, as an 18-year-old, um, is right exactly what he should be doing, which bodes into the neck, bodes and I use that word twice, doesn't even work it. Uh, that gets them to the next step to get them up to a, a, tech, a school. They'll teach them how to do it right, hopefully. And so, yeah, he's in it. He's in the pool. So he's doing well. If, he's just, if engineering is his thing, he's already started out well. Mm -hmm. Well, that kind of ties into my questions. I was going to ask you what you still listen to these days and then in what format. I listen to uh, classical music. Uh, I was a violinist from age 5 to 15, 16. Um, 
I'll tell you, I spent the rest, I spent my whole life out of curiosity and desire doing several levels of music. One is the performance level, two is the sideman level, three is the teaching level, four, in a sense, is the investigative level, and I always delved into music deeply. Um, so to answer your question, for the last year, I've been eating up literally the Ninth Symphony by Beethoven. I would say I almost hear it every night. I don't know why. It's kind of like you get into a food. you got to have it all the time. Mm -hmm. I think this uh, desire will wane. But I found three or four conductors, and every time that I listen to one version, I suddenly hear something inside the music that I haven't heard before. Mm -hmm. And then if I go to the next guy, like the guys that are right now are Bernstein, Muti, and Barenboim. And I have sort of alternated that. And every once in a while, another one will come in. And these are the guys whose uh, uh, interpretations of the ninth knock me out. So what I listen to is I listen to music, and I don't always hear the top part or the bottom part, but for the last number of years, I go to the middle. Mm -hmm. And sometimes, like in the, you know, the famous da, 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 da by Beethoven, when that is happening, I'm actually focused in on the violins because there's a whole uh, element of genius there that is not entirely uh, uh, available for people to, to hear. You have to look for things, and that helped me to develop my ear to an astonishing higher degree that I don't believe it would have happened without it. And I can listen to a symphony and hear, uh, you know, the second violin separated from the first violins. I can hear the, you know, the 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 the, tro the, the trombone and the thing and the, or the the guy tone line. So that's what I listen to. And in what format? Exactly in the format that you see here. I got my cell phone. I pop on uh, YouTube and I pop in my middle ear things. Um, mm -hmm. I'm in heaven. I'm in bed. I lay there and I listen to this music and. I'm not a religious person, but I've sort of had the spiritual sense that the ninth must be where God showed up. Mm -hmm. Because it, it is not possible, I mean, I'm being a little facetious here, that a mere human being could have written this work. So my, my focus as a listener is classical. I don't listen to contemporary music. Not because it isn't great, but because it doesn't attract my ear. I know they're great players, mm -hmm. and when they hire me every once in a while, I give them something, and they go, "Oh my God, listen! To, I never have, could I have a bass player like this." Mm -hmm. It's nothing. It's it's when I've aimed high. If I hit in the middle, I I sound better than a lot of guys that aim in the middle and hit low. Mm -hmm. it, and I'm not better than anybody else, but I've always aimed high in the listening, always aimed high in the seeking, always aimed high in the in the practicing. And uh, I, I never hit the moon, but I've gotten about 100 miles from it. You know what I mean? You so. say you listen to music with your headphones, but can you ever hear music in your head when there's actually nothing playing? Oh, all the time. Uh, there was a thing I used to do in New York when I lived there in the late 70s. Um, the subways back then, they had the older trains, and the windows would sometimes be open. And when you're going through the tunnels, there's this high white nose noise roar. <sighs> like this and one day I started to listen into the noise and imagine that I heard certain music and I literally check this out could hear it mm -hmm. it was actually in the white noise where I could hear a, a, a piano piece or in a it's like there's a lot of wind and you hear an orchestra in the distance and so, yeah, I can hear a lot of music in my head all the time. Do you have a name for that type of phenomena? Marvin? No, I don't. I don't really have a name for it. It's just... Well, because there are uh, sometimes... I, that happens to me. Like, I go to sleep and it's too quiet, and it's almost uh, like my head puts on some music. <laughs> right. Yeah, I, I think a lot of musicians have this, where sometimes they'll hear a song or... My, my son isn't a musician, but... One day I started to whistle a melody, and then he suddenly, about five minutes later, he says, Darn it, Dad, why'd you have to whistle that? I can't stop thinking about it. Now. You gave him an earworm? So, yeah, I think everybody might have some ability to do that, you know, uh, to hear music. And, and sometimes you can't shut it off. That, that happened to me as a kid. Again, child stories. I lived in Great Neck. And, uh, again, a Beethoven fan since I'm a child. Mm -hmm. I was wild about Beethoven. Don't know why. It just hit me. 
come out of high school and I started thinking of the Third Symphony because I'd heard it since I'm a kid, a, a little kid. I came out of high school. I was uh, that day, you know, it's like 11th grade, whatever. And I'm walking home and I'm hearing ba da 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 da. You know what I mean? And I suddenly realized I couldn't shut it off. I had to go through four movements of this symphony, even when I got home, to finally, you know, end it. Mm -hmm. It was a not a comfortable situation. I felt trapped, but it was a funny experience. Do you think the music was literally trying to speak to you and tell you something? No, my mind got locked into uh, a sound, and and somehow I couldn't shut it off. Mm -hmm. Or if I shut it off, I felt it was a physically uncomfortable thing. It's like doing this. Da, 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 da. Dun, oh, dun. by the way, <laughs> and I, you see, you had to do that. Right, because right. if you didn't do that, it wouldn't have been comfortable. Right, there's a loop in there. <laughs> it would have kept there's playing need, until like... I, it's like more like a need to resolve. Mm -hmm. Everything is resolving. That's music. That's everything is resolution. The whole thing in life is resolution. I mean, you, 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 you look at an Agatha Christie play, and the murderer is, and the guy spins to the left and points to the least likely guy. It's resolution. Mm -hmm. The end of a book, resolution. Beethoven. You know, it's resolution. And that's why I couldn't shut it off. I had to resolve the work in my head. So are your biggest musical influences then the classics like that? Or, because I heard that you're uh, a big I, Beatles fan. Oh, yeah. I mean, the, it was classical music till the Beatles. Mm -hmm. Then it was the Beatles. Then it was Cream mm -hmm. and Jack Bruce and mm -hmm. Ginger Baker, who I still regard as possibly the greatest, one of the greatest, most unique, most astonishing, most brilliant drummers of the mm -hmm. 20th century. Yeah, his name comes up minute. comes up a lot in my head when I talk to different musicians, and uh, I know yeah. that, uh, you know, especially because I just talked to Carl recently. So speaking of that kind of thing, are there collaborations that you would like to be in on or maybe that you haven't gotten around to? Hundreds of them, thousands of them. But I'm a little bit of the antichrist to a lot of people because I'm outspoken about music education, there's a uh, before therapy Jeff and an after therapy Jeff. And I've always been public about this mm -hmm. because I own my behavior before I went to therapy. Mm -hmm. And ironically, the therapy that I'm talking about that did me the most good began when I was 60. Mm -hmm. And by the I'm 64, I'll be 65 in January. Mm -hmm. And when I was 60 to about 63, I went through, I would call it a galvanese, galvan galvanizing explosion in me mm -hmm. not sure where it came from but at the end of it and after the therapy that I was a part of everything in my heart changed everything in the manner in which I interacted with people the way that I was in the world but before that I was a dislikable uh, angry man and there is a legacy for being dislikable and angry with people mm -hmm. you follow Mm -hmm. And so I own that. But my, my intention is I'm not the same guy. And I also have become spiritual enough to believe that what will happen will or what won't happen won't. Now to your question. I've, I've uh, collaborated with a lot of guys, but haven't recently, but want to. Jeff Beck is one guy. Um, there's a lot of uh, great guys that I'd love to collaborate, great jazz players. Wayne Shorter I would love to collaborate with. Um, uh, boy, who, I mean, I'm actually more these days in the collaboration element into, into the great players of rock. And that might be, uh, you know, guys like Jeff Beck, uh, um, uh, Derek Trucks, um, he would be marvelous. Uh, Vinny Hollywood is my old friend to play again with him. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not really sure. I like vocalists now where I used to not. Um, um, I like being a sideman. It's, it's a hard thing. I would say the gamut of music. I'd like to be the first guy to play a bass solo on a pop record that's numbered one or two. Mm -hmm. That has never happened, and I've always looked for a forward-thinking producer, mm -hmm. somebody who won't give it to a guitar player or a pianist, but give it to me because I have a very good sound that would work for that. You have a producer? And so far, I haven't... Huh? You have a producer in mind, somebody you'd like to work with? Well, Don Was is great. Uh, Rick Rubens is great. Uh, 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 Dan Huff is fantastic. I'm working now with a very great producer, John McCracken. He's great. Um, these are the guys that immediately come to mind. But I would say any of the top producers that have a little bit of an interest 
in the artistic mystery, the, the need to try something slightly different, because I, there are certainly great bass players, and don't you ever think I would believe that. In fact, the bass players today play better than I do. That's just a flat fact. But I have something that, that comes with age, which is um, an introspection into sound presentation of note, uh, a certain flavor that isn't definable nor teachable. And anyone who sticks in long enough in music finds their own a version of this. And I'm looking for a guy. I mean, it, it hasn't happened yet, but uh, we'll see. It may never happen. In fact, going out in the air, somebody may call someone else to do it. So, so you never know, I mean, because and, because I you can listen to my show not only when it's broadcast online in New York, Connecticut, uh, even parts of New Jersey, but what's really nice about it is through social media, I can repost it, and it also is accessible to anybody who has access to the Internet. So oh, okay. I can always save it as an MP4, because the other day I was talking about Yesterville, I was talking about Todd Rundgren, and someone calls me up and go, hey, you know, my cousin's the sound guy for Todd Rundgren. I'm like, he's on my list. I'm like, you have your cousin or whoever get in touch with me, so maybe we can somehow hook you up. Yeah, Todd <laughs> Rundgren's great. I love him. These are the guys I want to hook up with. I mean, while there's still time, we're all young enough, we're not yet, you know, confined to wheelchairs, walkers, or homes of, for the aged. We are, we are mobile. We are reasonably clear-headed, and I assume we are all as fanatically in love with music uh, as we always were. So, yeah, I'm, I'm in Nashville, Tennessee for that reason. I mean, mm -hmm. I'm here to branch out. I love music. I love people. Uh, I'm a liberated spirit. I'm a liberated soul. So with all of these things in line as they are, uh, let's see if good things can happen, because I'm, I'm still... I play pretty well still, you know, nothing's really... <laughs> I agree, and my friend Joe Berger would agree as well. He said that he saw you in NAM uh, this past January, and you guys have talked a couple times. Joe Berger. Uh-huh. He looks a little... Well, he's got he's got a beard, he's got a ponytail, he looks a little... Well, he's been around for a long time. You know he plays with Sting. He's in uh, Tokyo right now. He plays... He plays what guitar. Uh, I'm trying to remember. He said he's met you in January. He says you've talked a couple of times. I oh, have it. He? I have it on my Facebook page, which I can't open right now since you're on my not screen. But not a problem. I, I, I'm trying to recall. Um, Nam is a is a peculiar oper a com com peculiar environment. Mm -hmm. You meet ten thousand people in fifteen minutes. Right. You have to have, practically have like a, a webcam on your head to remember it all. I would imagine. <laughs> Sure, and, and and most of the people you meet are enthusiastic, great people. I mean, I, I'm a fan. I, I walk up to, like, you know, hey, Mr. Wonder. <laughs> I'm Jeff Berlin, and I'm a huge <laughs> fan of yours, you know. I mean, I do that whenever I meet guys, but I, 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 I'm a I'm a fan of a lot of guys. So mm -hmm. I, I, I guess Joe might be not a fan, but a colleague. I'll, I'll look him up. Mm -hmm. All right, so speaking of colleagues, can you see my video feed? No, I have a blank screen. Oh, I was going to say, all right, what I'm holding up is a copy of Road Games on vinyl. Can we talk oh, about okay. some of your colleagues? Because I'm looking at the back of this album, and there's there's a lot of great people on this album, and it lists Edward Van Halen. It doesn't say Eddie. And, of course, we got Frank Zappa on here. So any fond memories of recording this one? Well, very fond memories. Alan is was one of my best friends. Um we were more than just colleagues. It, you, you know how you meet people and you just click? Absolutely. You know, you, you're just in love. I, I actually, that happened the other day with a guitarist here. His name is Tom Hemby, mm -hmm. one of the top guitar players in Nashville. And we did a uh, show uh, last March, uh, a kind of a TV live music mm -hmm. broadcast. And we met. And I said, this is one of the most terrific guys I know. And he's a killer guitarist. Mm -hmm. And we've been hanging. And... Uh, so um, Alan was that kind of guy for me. We met many years ago. Actually, we met in the living room with Tony Williams in 1975, was it? And uh, but it, when we got with Bill, and that's when we really clicked as people. And then we played, and we were like in love with each other as the human beings that we were. Are you talking about uh, Mr. Bruford? When I played with Alan in Bill Bruford's band, mm -hmm. yes. I've only um, seen Bruford play live once, and it was at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame induction ceremony this year. Okay. Okay. Well, we had, we toured in Europe um, with Alan, and then in America with a really marvelous guitarist named John Clark, 
an English fellow. Um, but Alan and I were very close. I loved doing road games. We worked uh, a lot on the music. I mean, Alan played or came up with his music sort of by feel. I might suggest this or play another note to change the harmony there. Uh, it, it was collaborative, but it was entirely a, an Alan Holdsworth musical vision. Mm -hmm. You know, there's no denying his vision, his clear idea of what he wished to do. And as far as I know, that's the best-selling record he ever released. So, um, and yeah, it's an honor for me to be on it. They're, and to have played with all these guys, oh, that's great. They're not easy to come by. They are pretty expensive. I mean, this one was probably about 20 bucks, but I mean, come on, Zappa, Holdsworth, you, I mean, everybody, I would, I would, I would only wish that, um, a lot more people sort of recognized Alan's talent, but once again, it depends how old you are. Certain people, you know, they say, oh, Eddie Van Halen. I'm like, where do you think that Eddie kind of got his style from? And they don't know. That's sort of a shame to me. Well, yeah, um, Eddie got his thing be through, through introspection, uh, which I admire from him. He learned how to play in a way that a lot of younger players today really should emulate at. When Eddie heard Alan, Alan had that legato long line playing, that fluidity and to play like a multitude of notes in a run. Eddie didn't know exactly how Alan did that. And so by attrition and by working at it, he discovered that if he used two hands, he could reasonably, you know, uh, imitate that style. And that is a magnificent example of a self-taught, uh, reward uh, happening in a self-taught paradigm. Today in music, uh, there's books on solos, transcriptions of solos, music schools teach solos. Uh, there is an exposure to the, the rock flavored uh, playing, and it's all become acad academized. It's become like an, ac an academy-oriented production. And in my opinion, this is the ending of investigation. Eddie investigated by ear and created something different. And people who want to play should go through the same thing because the method works. And not only works, it works 100% of the time. Mm -hmm. And how do I know that? Because 100% of every name musician that everybody knows uh, is self-taught to some degree. Mm -hmm. So they, didn't wor they weren't aware of Eddie's uh, uh, roots, but a lot of guys are fans and not players. They're not, uh, you know, let's say music historians. They didn't. They just dug what they saw, and and that was enough. And really, that makes sense to me. You know, I, I don't always need to know, you know, the reason why uh, 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 that brush uh, contained that kind of bristle when those strokes were made. You know, on on the, on the Monet or something like that. Um, I don't know that much that, about art, but I know what I like. Well, yeah, and even that opens a thing. What I like isn't always means doesn't mean it's good. Mm -hmm. That there's sort of an argument that well, it's good if you like it. No, I mean you know I I could like like you know uh, dirt salad with with with, <laughs> with, with uh, croutons. It isn't good just because I like it. Mm -hmm. I like it, but that doesn't mean it's good. There's a lot of guys like cartoons or comics. It's not that good. It's it's it's. You know, there's, if you want to go by good, you go by substance in a, in a general sense. Entertainment's another thing, of course. But being good does not justify, excuse me, liking something does not justify its being worthy of anything. So, I can like a lot of things and, you know, dismiss it as fluff. But in music, a lot of guys say, well, if I like it, it has meaning. Or anything I play, that's another one. Anything I play has meaning because I meant it, I played it. Mm -hmm. Or anything I play is good. No, it's not. Or you could learn from everything. No, you can't. There's a lot of sort of broad stroke vagaries, you know, about learning. And in that regard, I would say uh, music uh, is, as an art, anything you do is good. Anything. Anything so in art. So Upside down, inside out, backwards, the, the salad, with anything. Whatever it is, that's your art. Learning is not its specific. And so I'd like a lot of guys to realize that. So if someone was just starting out, not sure if they wanted to play guitar or bass, who would you suggest that they study for technique? Well, I wouldn't suggest they study with anybody until they made a choice. Mm -hmm. 
Do you want to discuss the uh, the whole base education and how you got how you got into that? I, I would. Um, base education is, if you look at it from an overview, is no different than any other instrument that sh is taught. Um, you go back 400 years, even right from, let's say, back in the 17th century or 16th century, I think the church invented written music, but uh, I, I, I'm not a scholar in this, but I'll generalize, that for 400 years, the only way that musicians were taught, who weren't self-taught, by the way, self-taught is a different paradigm, there's only self-taught and there's only taught by music, that are validatable, you can validate them, and that have historical precedence. Anyways, all music was taught by reading and practicing. That's it. Literally, that's it. Somebody said, here's your music, practice it. Here's your piano, practice it on it. Here's your violin, practice it on it. And except for being self-taught, which, let's say, mostly, if not nearly all African musicians, South American musicians, the ethnic musics of Japan, the ethnic music of India, they were all self-taught and self-created. But anybody that was educated were own, was only taught music. Okay. A time has come now in base education, where that's no longer the case. Now it's about groove, which is feeling, uh, feel, of course, locking with drummers, using metronomes so you could lock with a click track, um, and things that are based in rock education, as I mentioned earlier, uh, teaching styles, gospel style, blues style, rock style, um, uh, R&B. Everybody that played in rock is self-taught that has success in the idiom. Nobody went to school. The guys that went to school learned music. They usually point to the Dream Theater guys and uh, Steve Vai that went to Berkeley. But they learned music there, harmony, uh, uh, arranging and writing classes. Bass education has changed because it is no longer focused on music first. It's focused on something else. And because it is, bass players don't have a, a, a platform, a, a fundamental ability and understanding of the language of music or how to relate to their instrument in order to then become good enough to become expressive and artistic. It's a backward thing. In fact, it's so backwards, uh, unfortunately, in this era that musicians who should be learning rock or blues or feel or groove at home are paying big bucks to do it at music school. And instead of going to music school to learn written music and the substance of music, which is where you go to do it because it's so hard to know, to find it, how to uh, learn this music on your own. Instead of going to a music school to learn music, they go at home and they're trying to teach themselves how to read and play uh, uh, music, written music. I was very, it's, it's, I was uh, very surprised to recently, there was a video with Todd Rundgren when he was at Berkeley and I didn't realize that he was self-taught and that he didn't know how to read music. Right. You know, that's a val that's that's valid. Self-taught exists. It's entire it, the entire artistic world rests on a self-taught paradigm. What it also may consist of is the learning of music which teaches us two things only: instrument, how it works and how it functions, and music. <laughs> I mean, that's it. People say, well, how do I apply these scales, or how do I apply this stuff to my art? You don't. It was never meant for that. Uh, music is meant to learn music. That's it. How do you apply a verb to a conversation? It, it, you know, how do you apply hot uh, pepper and sage and, and rosemary, you know, to a stew? How do you... It, it's not an application. It is a learning of. What is this thing? It is called sage. How does it work? It has this flavor. It has this fragrance. And in the use and in the artistic self-taught or often by recipes, you, you, you know, you get to use it. Mu uh, musicians uh, uh, try to apply academic principles that have never been meant to apply. And they don't know. They literally don't know that this is not the way to do it. And the only reason I know is because I'm 64, I'll be 65. I started at five years old in perfect musical studies and continued studying until yesterday night. Mm -hmm. When you first, I, pick, I, when you first picked ahead. up an instrument, was it something that your parents encouraged you to do or something that you asked for? 
they encouraged me. Mm -hmm. uh, when I was a baby, apparently like a year, two, year, year and a half, two years, my father was an opera singer, and, and, I, and the story in the family is, is that he would sing these Italian leader, Italian arias, leaders German, Italian, Italian songs, and I would sing them back phonetically. You know, I even remember one right now. You know, it's funny how that stuff sticks with you. And I learned them as a, as, as a, as just out of infancy. Oh, we got, he's a genius. He's the next uh, Heifetz, you know. <laughs> Jewish kids on violin. Is that a stereotype or what? So they, they got me a violin. I played so, for 10 years. I studied. I was a so seriously we can, trained. We can add child prodigy to your long list of uh, accolades. That prodigy. I, I was dedicated. I was a good violinist. I played in orchestras, you know, Long Island regional orchestras as a, as a kid. I played in string quartets. I was concert master in high school. Um, um, and then the Beatles came along and I found my, my niche. So do you want to discuss uh, Joe Frazier? Joe Frazier, the new one, is, uh, oh, that's great. Um, Joe was a, a hero to me. Um, I think in my angry period, I would call it. Um, a little bit of violence was sort of a part of me where now I, I loathe it. And um, Joe Frazier was sort of an image for an out of balance human being like me, which is a guy who smoked, meaning coming forward and, and unrelenting. I mean, he was a train. And I, I was thrilled by the image of such a human being because I wasn't wired that way, you know. Mm -hmm. It was never that tough at all. And uh, I wrote Joe Frazier. We did it with Bill Bruford. Then I did it again as a, uh, 10 years later. And now I just wrote a third Joe Frazier, completely different than the other two and easily the best of the pack. Mm -hmm. All right, so I'll have to check that out and um, play some of it, obviously, on my show. I wasn't really sure how much time you have today, but... If you want to summarize, what are you most grateful for career-wise? I'll tell you what I'm grateful for career-wise. First and foremost, and I mean this, the kind people who have stuck with me over 30, 40 years, and the new people who I'm introduced to now. Um, people are important to me. And as a career musician, as a, even as a traveling clinician, I'm grateful for them. In terms of uh, music, I'm grateful that I'm more expressive in it. I'm freer on the bass than I've ever been. I'm slower on the bass than I've ever been. But I have a lot of great ideas that I never had. Um, I'm grateful to be on the radio with Gwen from Long Island, from, from <laughs> Stony Brook, because simply because I play four bass strings, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It's not the mere fact that you're interviewing me. It's that there was a reason for it being sought out. That, to me, is an honor, and I mean it. And all the good things that have happened, all the good people I meet, um, I don't particularly apologize for my firm stance in education. I don't apologize for believing what I believe. I do accept the fact that people have a choice and ought to make their own choices. So I share what I do, and I'm grateful for the fact that I can agree to disagree, and they can agree to disagree, and still have lovely people in my in my life. I'm I'm on a new base website, and I'm writing to them things that I wrote some years ago, and not one person was casting casting as me. What's the word casting? You casting. mean uh, like making comments and stuff on your pages, or? Well, negative comments, because it's easy to do, you know, uh, I love Trump, I hate Trump. Well, you're a son of a gun, uh, you're, you're Yeah, your I was going to say, that would be a gun, conversation you know? for another day, because <laughs> that would go on and on. <laughs> but it's more the Trump issue, it's more the fact that in America now, you fairly well can't stay pro or con without getting a punch in the face from, from somebody. From somebody, exactly, when you're going to disagree I, with somebody When I eventually. go and do this, and I don't go for that, you know, it's, it's, I have my own beliefs, and they're firm, but... I see things that uh, I won't comment about. I don't feel compelled to, you know, believe what you believe. That's what America stands for. You got to take a knee. Take a knee. That's literally what America stands for. America, I mean, there was a time when, what was it during the Olympics when uh, the black athletes raised fists, the Black Panther uh, mm -hmm. uh, salute? Mm -hmm. uh, they won the gold medal. And, oh, my God, they're, they're saluting the Black Panther salute, you know. 
You know, in the same Olympics, George Foreman marched around with a little American flag because he was part of the, uh, what was that, the works program that Lyndon Johnson instituted, mm -hmm. and he's from Houston, uh, George Foreman, and he marched with an American flag, and some people are going, oh, who is this guy walk marching around with an American flag? You can't win in this country. So what is the country permitted? It's permitted that you can't win. It's permitted that you can take a knee. It's permitted that you can stand. It's permitted that you can raise your hands in a Black Panther salute. And it's permitted that you can raise the American flag with pride. So I'm saying this not to be a preacher, but to include the fact that when I go on this new base website, I say things like, well, these principles, uh, as far as I'm concerned, don't work. Well, Jeff, okay, thanks very much. I've seen it work, I think. And, and, and they're kind about it. So while in this era, the tone of our brethrenship in this country has darkened, I don't notice that among bass players who I have discourse with about learning how to play. It's really marvelous. To, to me, music is a universal language, and that's actually how I friended Joe Berger. We were at a Craig Leon show, and like you were saying about instant friendships, all of a sudden we started talking about Alan Holdsworth, and I was like, no way, and he showed me pictures of him hugging Alan. I'm like, I had never met Alan, and here he is hugging yeah. him. I'm like, we're friends now. Yeah, yeah. So it was my well, pleasure. I mean, it was my pleasure to talk to. Do I'm you sorry, want? Go ahead. I interrupted you. Go well, ahead. That's okay. Finish. I was going to say, do you want? I don't know how much time you have. It's already. I have uh, oh, okay. So then I don't have a problem. If you don't have a problem, what else do you want to talk about? What personal projects do you want to plug? Well, I have a base education series, but it entails people being serious about uh, wanting to play. It's a reading series. That's my plug. Um, I don't believe that one can find a sequence of reading studies starting from the very, very, very basic, most basic beginning reading one can do, proceeding to reasonably and fairly sophisticated reading, where one step uh, enters smoothly into the second, into the third, into the fourth, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I wrote out, took me a while, a whole series of exercises that, again, have nothing to do with art, have nothing to do with the blues, have nothing to do with anything except to teach us how to play music. Um, reading music is a four, is a four point experience. It unites brain, eyes, music, hands, and instrument. Five points, I meant to say. You understand? Mm -hmm. To play a G written on a piece of music paper requires five distinct uh, conceptual uh, events. One, I have to register it's a G. My eyes have to see it. Uh, you know, you, you don't have to do it this way, but there's a sequence of body, instrument, and music in one split second. Do this enough times, then you can play anything you think about. Anything. I do it every day. I come up with songs that I heard 35 years ago and pick up the bass, and I'm playing it more or less perfectly. So where does someone I, check it out? Is it online? Yeah, it'll be on, the, let me see, where will that be? Jeff Berlin Bass Education. It's a Facebook page. Okay. Is and, that something uh, they subscribe to? Yeah, you can. Huh? Is it something that they subscribe to? Yeah, I think so. And um, you become a member, and which is just signing on. And then when it comes out, they'll sell it to you. But the thing is, is I, I don't know what the course is course, $100 or something. But you have principally maybe three months to a year of reading for a hundred bucks. Mm -hmm. Sounds like a great I mean, deal. If, mm -hmm. if, what now? Sounds like a great deal. I don't want to uh, break the bank. Mm -hmm. You know, I've given away personal. I've given away uh, a lot of music uh, for free for decades to people. Just gave it away. Here's an exercise. Take it. I mean, on the internet. Uh, in clinics and gave and gave and gave and I never made a penny and I said you know at this time of my age I don't see why I can't make something meaningful to people and try to make some money at the same time and do it in a way where it's honest I honestly think these are some of the best reading etudes any bass player will find because I come from such a long line of, of studies that I can begin at the beginning and start with a whole note and proceed to eight and sixteenths and dotted eights and sixteenths and rests etc etc cetera, et cetera. Any other advice you want to give to someone just starting out that says they want to play bass? Well, I have a couple of thoughts, and they're unpopular. One, don't practice with a metronome because a metronome becomes the priority 
in learning. The metronome states that we bass players don't have the ability to learn how to play in time, and we do. The metronome is a crutch. It's almost a cult object. You cannot imagine a bass player or a bass teacher or a, anybody even re remotely suggesting to their students, do not put the metronome on. I want you to tap your foot. I want you to subdivide. And I want you and give you permission to sound bad so that you can go through this, figure out what the subdivision of the bass part feels like, and then proceed to sound good. The great musicians that play in time, and there's a 10,000 times 10,000 videos on YouTube, never used a metronome to uh, acquire their time. But in bass, in bass uh, parlance, in bass uh, communication, bass, you know, it's metronome or nothing. And I can tell people straight that if they don't use a metronome and you're new, you're going to learn how to play better in time because you're going to give yourself time to make mistakes and fix them while tapping your foot. That's about the biggest uh, uh, suggestion I can make. Make mistakes. Uh, they're going to happen anyway. Don't worry about it. Review, repeat, and don't play in time when you're not able to play the instrument yet. Well, I appreciate your time. I will Thank certainly you. throw a lot of your music in with the show. I'll edit it and then I'll send it back to you. If there's anything that you want to change or leave out, you feel free to let me know. And uh, if I can get it on the air for this Wednesday, I will. If not, I'm going to throw it in November because we have Zapathon coming on for Halloween. So. Ah. <laughs> okay. Well, how was this? Was this okay that I talked oh, too perfect. much? No, no, it's perfect.